The Iberian Peninsula during the Middle Ages was known for two things. One is that Al-Andalus was supposedly this great land of unending prosperity, tolerance, and scholarship. And on the other hand, this was a land riven by war between Muslims and Christians for control of Spain and Portugal. Which, if either of these narratives, is true? Well, let's find out today when we study medieval Spain between 711 and 1492 and look at it as a frontier society. A topic as broad as medieval Iberia with its 700-year span is something which needs some central organization in order for it to really be something that someone can wrap their heads around in a fairly short amount of time. So with that in mind, there are four questions that I want you to keep in mind while you're watching this video. One, how well does the classic Reconquista narrative fit Spain's development over the course of the Middle Ages? The Reconquista narrative is that basically as soon as the Muslim conquest was completed in 711, the Christians immediately began waging a holy war that they understood as a holy war, and they eventually won in 1492. Question two, was Al-Andalus the tolerant and enlightened land of learning that it is sometimes touted as? Or is this a lot more complicated than that, and this was a time in an, er in an area where um, the fortunes of learning and tolerance and other things varied over time. Which is more true? And is this an area which experienced more learning than others, so far as we can tell? Question three, how applicable are general trends in medieval history to this region? For instance, does the rise of feudalism or the conflict between the crown and nobles, are these things that we see in Iberia the same way that we see them in places like Byzantium or France? And finally, question four, how does understanding Iberia during this period as a frontier society help to balance out and focus our understanding of medieval Iberia? One concept that I'd like to introduce right now is the idea of a frontier society. Basically, a society which is between two different civilizations and which has characteristics of both. And another characteristic of a frontier society is that people in it tend to be relatively tolerant of differences because they have no choice but to be. So, I think that if we look at Spain and understand it as a frontier society, where people kind of implicitly had to accept the people around them, then a lot of this will actually make a lot more sense, and answering this question will then shed a lot of light on the first three questions as well. So without any further ado, let's set the clock back to 7-Eleven and start working our way forward to 1492 so Columbus can go and sell the ocean blue. Let's begin at the beginning, the Moorish conquest in 7-Eleven. So, the Visigothic army at this time was engaged in a civil war. There were at least two contenders, one of whom was King Roderick. Now, when the Arabs landed in 711, Roderick broke away from his activities and marched south to meet them. And in battle, Roderick was killed and his army was dispersed. After Roderick's uh, death, it looked like it would still be almost impossible for the Arabs to make a full conquest of Spain. They might be able to pick up some cities and call it a day and maybe try again later. But the problem is that Visigothic society had become demilitarized in the last century or so, and it looks like it was very difficult for the locals to organize themselves into a cohesive military resistance. It also uh, suggests that the locals weren't really all that alarmed about the invasion, comparatively speaking. So, in the end, what happens is a relatively small force of Arabs and Berbers are able to establish control over most of the country over the next several years, and they do so in a fairly haphazard fashion. Now, the conquerors focus heavily on the rich southern and northeastern sectors of Iberia, and they largely ignore the poorer mountainous northwest. So this explains why they were able to hold on to the south and those areas for so long, whereas resistance began to accumulate up north. 
one of the unfortunate facts about 8th century Spain is that it's very poorly recorded in our sources, so a lot of what we know is very sketchy and may have been muddled by historians writing with limited records at a later date. At any rate, moving aside from those concerns, let's look into what we think we know. It looks like there was a kingdom of Asturias which formed a, between about 718 and 722, give or take. And it looks like what happened is that there was an isolated Berber garrison up north and that the locals in the area were able to organize and take out that garrison. And that garrison was not really reinforced because of how thinly stretched the moors were. Um, and the origins of this event are fairly poorly known just because we don't really have a written account of a story in history and all the way until 883 so about a hundred and sixty years later this new kingdom of Asturias is uh, traditionally attributed to a Visigothic nobleman named Pelagius we have no idea whether he's actually real or not and Asturias will later change its name to the kingdom of Leon when the capital of the kingdom is moved to Leon and Leon is probably a much better known uh, medieval kingdom than Asturias ever was so when Leon appears, this is where it came from. One recurring pattern in medieval Spanish history is that the Christian kingdoms tend to gain the most when the Moors are most at odds with one another. And this begins very early. So by 731 to 32, there is a full-scale Berber revolt. There had been tensions between the Arabs and the Berbers for years, and these finally turned into a full-fledged revolt. It most likely occurred because the Arabs were treating the Berbers as second-class partners rather than as equals, and then that fueled enough resentment to form a revolt. Well, uh, the Caliphate in Damascus sent more Arabs from Syria, and be between them and the Arabs who were already there, they were finally able to put down this revolt. However, there was now friction between the new Arabs and the previously settled Arabs. So you basically replaced one problem with a problem that's almost identical, just different in terms of who the people involved are. So at this point we have lots of tribal rivalries among the Arabs and we have factional struggles that break out in the 740s. And these struggles are actually pretty typical of those that are going on throughout the Caliphate, the struggles which ultimately will culminate in the Abbasid Revolution. And during this period of division, Asturias is able to capitalize on this and attack uh, exposed regions and expand its borders. In the Middle East, the Abbasid Revolution broke out and the Abbasids managed to successfully kill almost the entirety of the Umayyad dynasty. However, Abd al-Rahman I managed to escape from the massacre and he managed to get all the way to Al-Andalus in 756. And at the time, Al-Andalus was embroiled in another civil war. So, Ahmed al-Rahman I offers himself up as a leader and manages to unite all of the lands of the Moors in Spain. And he forms what is known as the Emirate of Cordoba. And this will unify the Arabs and the Berbers for the time being. Now, because his main priority is reunifying all of the Arabs and Berbers, he ignores Asturias, which has gained a fair amount during this time of crisis. However, the areas that they control are still pretty regional mountain areas, and these areas were not really of great concern for the Moors. After all, the Moors controlled all the good stuff, so they weren't super concerned about Asturias. Now it's time for some new kids to emerge on the block. In 824, there is an uprising of the Basque, and this leads to the formation of the Kingdom of Navarre under a Basque leader named Inigo Arista. So, Navarre is a mountainous region on the border between France and Spain, and Navarre will long be trapped between these two much larger powers. Um, Originally, Navarre will be known as the Kingdom of Pamplona, but because that name doesn't really stick around very long, we'll just keep referring to them as Navarre, even though it is a bit anachronistic. There's a new dynasty that is set up in Navarre in 905, which will run for a while, 
and Navarre will manage to get itself implicated in all of the dynastic marriages of its neighbors, and this will mean that they will variously control different areas around them or be subject to the rule of outsiders at various times in its history. So now Navarre is on the board. One narrative about Spain is that it was a land which was constantly engaged in religious-based warfare. And for the most part, that narrative is simply untrue. Um, there's an Arab visitor named Ibn Haqqal who visits Cordoba in 948, and he reported that the majority of the rural population in the emirate of Cordoba was Christian. We do know that there is some Arabization of the Christians in southern Spain, and that Latin remained central to their identity. And by Arabization, I just mean that they began to dress and act more like Arabs without necessarily um, adopting that identity. Which means that while the difference between them and the actual Arabs would be obvious to both them and the Arabs, a northern visitor from, say, Asturias might not be able to see that difference as clearly. So, we also know from the chronicles in the Arab South that Christians were almost always allowed to hold high office in Cordoba. And by almost always, I mean that there were some rulers there and also some periods where religious tensions would be higher than others. But as a general rule, Christians were mostly allowed to do anything that a Muslim could do, with one major exception. There was a limit on who a Christian could marry. So if you're a Muslim man, you're allowed to take a Christian wife because the state is officially Islamic and they want to encourage Muslims. But if you're a Christian man, you can't take a Muslim wife because that would be encouraging the growth of the Christian faith at the expense of the Muslim faith. So that was really the only disadvantage that um, Christians in Cordoba faced on the regular. But now let's look at some interesting exceptions and some of the periods of tension. One of the greatest times of Christian persecution was when Christians in the Emirate of Cordoba brought persecution down upon themselves in what is known as the Martyr Movement. This occurred under the reign of the Umayyad ruler Muhammad I, who ruled from 852 to 886. And it was a time of great tension because of what this Christian group called the Martyr Movement was doing. Now, the goal of the martyr movement was to emulate Jesus by seeking death by judicial execution. This is based on what the martyrs in the Roman Empire had done. They had denounced the gods of Rome, or refused to denounce Jesus, and been executed by the Roman state as being disloyal. Well, because the emirate is officially Islamic, these Christians would go around and publicly denounce Islam and the prophet Muhammad, and then be executed by the state. Um, and something else that is interesting that needs to be kept in mind is that this martyr movement did not really last all that long. Another really interesting fact about Al-Andalus is that despite the long tenure of Islam in this area, it took until the 10th to 11th centuries when this area became very dominantly Muslim. Um, at first, the sort of rate of conversion was very low, and then it really took off in the 10th to 11th centuries. That might have a lot to do with the rulers at that time, who I believe were the Almoravids, and they were much more hardcore. It could have also had something to do with the fact that, uh, you know, people saw Islam as dominant, and it had been dominant for so long in this area that people began to uh, want to associate themselves with what they saw as, you know, what was ultimately going to be the winning side. Anyway, it's hard to really determine the motives which went behind this great conversion, but it could have been a combination of, you know, pressure from a new regime and, you know, simply giving in to what was around you and what had been around your ancestors for generations at this point. So when Abd al-Rahman had established the Emirate of Cordoba, he had basically given up on the claim to Mayad universality, and he thought that by making himself simply the ruler of Spain, he could get the Abbasids off his back. Well, they clearly did try to take Spain back from him, but ultimately they gave up as Abbasid power began to fade pretty quickly. But by 929, one of um, the successors to the Umayyad throne, 
decided to declare himself caliph. Abd ar rahman III decided that he was going to revive the Umayyad Caliphate, and he declared himself to be the 15th Umayyad Caliph. Um, this period of Umayyad history runs up until the year 1031. Um, and this didn't really change their borders, by the way. It just changed the pretensions that they claimed for themselves. And it's during this caliphal period that um, Al-Andalus actually built many of its most impressive architectural achievements and also saw many of its greatest scholars living and working, um, especially at the city of Cordoba itself. This was sort of the golden age of Cordoba. In the far north, we'll see that aristocratic competition and the tendency of nobles to try to break away from their kings leads to this area known as Castile coming under the domination of a nobleman named Fernan Gonzalez, and he claims the title of Count by about the mid-10th century. This area will be called the County of Castile, but over time it will evolve into a kingdom. And for those of you who don't already know, Castile will later become the dominant power in Iberia. Let's return to the north where Asturias has become Leon. And in Lyon, the monarchy is open to any man in the royal family. But one requirement, not officially, but for all practical intents and purposes, is that a king is expected to lead his armies in person. And to do that, you have to have some basic level of physical fitness and mobility. The problem for Sancho I is that he earned his nickname the Fat for being too fat to mount a horse, meaning that he could not effectively lead his armies in the battle. So when he took the throne in 958, he was quickly overthrown, and somehow, even though he couldn't mount a horse, he was able to flee from Lyon. He visited his uncle in Navarre to ask for support, and then he visited Cordoba, and there he was given medical treatment which enabled him to lose enough weight to mount a horse. Eventually, in 959 and the 960, he returned and he was able to reclaim the throne in a civil war. However, um, his court became dominated by foreign nobles, and this made him unpopular with many of his other nobles in the area, and this led to the revolt of the region of Galicia, which is in the northwest of Iberia, and eventually, um, you know, Galicia will uh, break into two as well, as we'll see going forward. Let's shift our attention to the east in Navarre and look at the reign of another Sancho, Sancho III the Great, who ruled from 1004 to 1035. Sancho earned his nickname by extending his kingdom's control to include the county of Barcelona in the east and the Duke of Gascony in the north, both of whom had formally sworn their fealty to the Franks. And because his son came to the throne in Castile, they tried to work together to overthrow Leon in 1031, but when Sancho died, this enabled Leon's king, Bermudo III, to rally, and that delayed the process of destroying Leon by several years. The death of Sancho III may have ruled out a father-son pincer on Leon, but it did not rule out a brother-and-brother -brother pincer. So, Fernando of Castile and Garcia IV of Navarre resumed their pincer attack on Lyon, and this war would resume in 1035. Um, the decisive moment was the Battle of Tamarin in 1037, where Bermudo III of Lyon died in battle, and the line of the Asturias dynasty died out. This led to Fernando claiming the title of Fernando I, and his new kingdom is now called Lyon Castile and he would rule from 1037 up until 1068. Since things aren't complicated enough, let's introduce a new player to the Game of Thrones in Iberia, and that new player is the Kingdom of Aragon. Originally, this area was under the jurisdiction of Navarre. However, Ramiro was given this land by his father, Sancho the Great, but since Ramiro was illegitimate, his brother, the King of Navarre, decided to try to press his claim to this land, so they had to fight a war, Ramiro won, and he was able to achieve independence. So from the time of its foundation in 1035 all the way up until 1285 when the borders would all stabilize, Aragon pressed south at the expense of Al-Andalus pretty continuously. 
Um, in 1162, the Kingdom of Aragon changed its name to the Crown of Aragon when they added Catalonia and Valencia. And the Crown of Aragon is different than the Kingdom because this means that they rule over these areas, but the amount of control is less direct. And it was sometime also under the um, you know, banner of the Crown of Aragon when the Aragonese would also establish a claim on Sicily. However, we're not going to go into detail on that because that just makes things unnecessarily confusing and complex. Al-Andalus had been taking a pounding during this time, not nearly as bad as what appeared on the previous map. The only reason I used that map was because that was the only graphic of Aragon that I could find that looked remotely decent and presentable. At any rate, um, Al-Andalus was still taking a pounding, and that was really undermining the legitimacy of the caliphate at Cordoba. So this led the locals to call for a new dynasty to take over and lead them, and this led to the rise of the Almoravid dynasty. Now, the Almoravids have a history which was rooted in Africa. They were actually a Berber dynasty, and they were tied to the Malachite school of Islam, which I don't really know anything about, but if you're interested, you can look it up for yourself. Now, um, there are African holdings for the Almoravids all the way from 1040 on, and they established their capital at Marrakesh in Morocco in 1062. By 1076, they had conquered the Ghana Empire to their south, so they are basically a west coast of Africa empire for the most part. However, then they shift focus when in 1086 they're offered an invitation into Al-Andalus by the disillusioned nobles there who were looking for strong leadership. And the Almoravids are able to stem the advance of Aragon and Castile, which had been on a full-fledged offensive, but they weren't actually able to reconquer anything because of how uh, strong Aragon and Castile had become. And in 1126, the Almoravids showed their more hardcore Islamic um, tendencies when they actually deported all of their remaining Christian communities in Al-Andalus to Morocco. The you know, thought being here that the Christians are potentially disloyal by virtue of their faith, so it's best to keep them away from the frontier where they might betray um, Al-Andalus in favor of their Christian neighbors. Now, you might be tempted to think that in a land with this many kingdoms, the most famous man in the 11th century would be one of the kings who were constantly at war. But you would be wrong, because the most famous person of the 11th century in Iberia was El Cid. Now, his real name was Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, and he was a minor noble from Castile. He was born in the year 1043. El Cid simply means the Lord, and it, it's thought that that title actually comes from Arabic, He's also called El Campeador, which means Outstanding Warrior, and he is the subject of the Poem of the Cid, which is basically an epic in his honor, which makes him into a Christian hero, which is a bit weird when you actually look at his real life. Now, he started out life as one of the generals in a Castilian civil war, and he rose to prominence in one king's service. However, that king didn't live for long, and when he died, the king that he had defeated came to power, and this meant that Vivar was out of favor. And then the king ordered Vivar into exile in 1041. So, uh, El Cid was not really content to live in exile as a nobody, so he entered service under the Muslim rulers of Zaragoza, and he fought against all comers, Christian and Muslim. Now, he was recalled to Castile when the Almoravids invaded Iberia, and he fought well there, but ultimately he still had some issues with the Castilian throne. So later he, um, was, he established a holding of his own in Valencia and declared independence, so he set up a small kingdom there in 1094. Later on, he would die in 1099, and his widow would continue the independence of Valencia up until 1102 when she is surrendered to the Almoravids. So, um, this guy is a great national hero for Spain, and he's seen as a Christian crusader. The problem is, however, he served under the Muslims, and he also broke away from the Kingdom of Castile, which, you know, the Spanish in their Reconquista narrative would probably say is a kingdom blessed by God. So it's a weird sort of uh, 
set of mental gymnastics that go into it, but what it does reveal that's much more interesting than the Spanish narrative is that um, it was possible for um, people during this period to serve other powers, that people were not bound by their personal religion when it came to where they lived and worked, and that if you were a capable warrior, you could get work anywhere in the peninsula. So um, that's really the takeaway from the story of the Cid, more so than his little stint as the king of Valencia or his um, reputation as being this great Christian hero. And let's face it, this picture in Iberia with all of these warring kingdoms is not nearly complicated enough, so let's introduce yet another one. Now we've already talked about how Galicia broke away in the far west and north of Iberia. Well, now there's a count of Portugal, which is basically the southern half of Galicia, and that breaks away from Galicia under Count Afonso, who has the backing of local nobles and the church and he declares himself King Alfonso I of Portugal in 1139. Now, he decides to go after the city of Lisbon in 1147, and he is greatly aided by crusaders coming in from the north, especially Englishmen. And when they stop in at a Portuguese port, they receive a sermon from the Bishop of Porto who says that all crusading deeds are equal, and that by helping the Portuguese to take Lisbon, they will be doing something great for the cause that will be equally valid uh, when compared to conquest in the Middle East. So the Crusaders stay and they aid King Afonso in taking Lisbon, which would be the capital of Portugal um, from that point until the present. Now um, this capture is generally seen as part of the Portuguese Reconquista, but for obvious reasons is also claimed by the Second Crusade since uh, the English and some of the Scandinavians present also gave quite a bit of support to this effort. Because the 12th century was this age of crusading kings, you might think that the craze of the Crusades would have legitimated Alfonso beyond any kind of challenge. However, that's not the case. So Alfonso I the Conqueror spent his long reign from 1139 to 1185 trying to seek complete independence and gain international recognition. The problem is his cousins on the throne of Lyon always considered him to be a rebel and tried to reconquer Portugal many times. And it was only in 1179 when Portugal was able to get a papal bull declaring that Portugal was a legitimate independent power and that it only owed suzerainty to the Pope himself. I assume that this papal bull arrived after a substantial payment of money from the Portuguese crown to the papacy, or the Portuguese declared their actions against the um, Moors to be part of a crusade. One or the other is certainly the case. The Almoravid realm did not actually last all that long because another Berber power emerged in North Africa called the Almohads, and they quickly went from their origins in the Atlas Mountains in the 1120s to expelling the Almoravids from Morocco by 1147, and then conquering the remainder of the Maghreb, which is the area between Morocco and Libya, basically the North African desert, excluding Egypt, by 1159. They later entered into Al-Andalus and claimed all of the remaining lands of the Muslims there, and they held all those territories by 1172. At the Battle of Las Navas de Toulouse, um, the alliance of the Christian kingdoms managed to crush the Almohads and they were temporarily completely on the run and losing land but then uh, they managed to stabilize by about 1230 and those borders would hold for quite a while. In 1212 Sancho del Forte died and that led to the absorption of the long-lived Kingdom of Navarre into the Kingdom of France. And now that this kingdom was basically just a client state of France, it was out of contention and it would no longer be internationally important in Western European affairs. Spain reclaimed this land in the 16th century, but by then the Basque identity that is prevalent in Navarre today had taken hold, and that identity continues to this very day. 
By the 12th century, the idea of the Reconquista had really taken hold in the hearts and minds of Spanish and Portuguese leaders, and Portugal would continue to push forward after they captured Lisbon in 1147. They established two native crusading orders, the Order of Aviz and the Order of St. James, and those orders would wage perpetual warfare trying to expand southward. They also were aided during this period by elements of the Knights Templar, and because of the efforts of the Knights Templar during the Portuguese Reconquista, the Portuguese crown would aid local Templars in the early 14th century when the Pope ordered a general purge, as did several monarchs, and you know some of the surviving Templars would then be integrated into other orders of knights and their identities would be disguised. At any rate, um, the last area that Portugal had to reconquer to complete its Reconquista was Algarve in the south coast. And this area would eventually be conquered in 1249. And after that point, what we see is that um, the only neighbors that Portugal has left by land are now other Christians. So their Reconquista ends early. And another thing that they will have to um, endure is a series of border wars with Castile until they reach a treaty in 1297, which will set up the present borders of Portugal. They also will form an Anglo-Portuguese treaty in 1373, and this is the world's oldest alliance. It still stands to this day. Another process which will continue after the end of the Portuguese Reconquista is that we will see Portugal experience a gradual cultural homogenization and also um, continue to grow in a separate direction from Spain to its east and you know form a distinctive Portuguese identity and language. Of all of the kings of Castile, none of them was more successful than Ferdinand III who came to power in 1217. In 1230, the throne of Lyon was due to go to one of his sisters, but Ferdinand contested the will, and he contested the will with a force much more effective than a lawyer. He had an army. So he managed to claim the throne of Lyon and then formally unite this kingdom into just the crown of Castile. So there is no more Lyon Castile, just simply Castile. And then in 1231, he also claimed the throne of Galicia, which was now isolated in the northwest and fell to him pretty easily. At the same time, um, the Almohads had fallen into a civil war, and Ferdinand launched an all-out attempt at Reconquista between 1225 to 1284, and as you can see from the map, he was extremely successful in this effort, and he gained a lot of territory. As well, um, the Aragonese also took a fair amount themselves under their king, who was named James at the time. In 1230, the Emirate of Granada emerged, and it was ruled by the Nazareth dynasty. The Emirate of Granada is also sometimes called the Kingdom of Granada, and this was destined to last between 1230 and 1492. It is the last of the Moorish states in Iberia. Granada was able to prosper for most of its history due to all of its North African trade connections, but after about 1415 or so, economic activity took a big hit due to a lot of Portuguese attacks in Africa, which disrupted this trade. And that also created a lot of refugees, so by 1450, Granada was getting refugees from North Africans in the south and from people on the frontiers of um, the Emirate of Granada. So the city of Granada itself by 1450 was the largest city in Europe for a short time mostly due to refugees coming in. Although the borders between 1230 and 1492 were more or less fixed, um, the marches between these kingdoms would be pretty fortified, and Castile, Aragon, and Granada all would have fortified borders, where they would settle military aristocrats, and those guys would be responsible for trying to raid and advance the borders of their kingdoms. Um, one thing that Granada had going for it that enabled it to hold out against two much more powerful neighbors for so long is that it was able to benefit from the Sierra Nevada mountains and not have to fortify everything and you know take advantage of some of that natural rough terrain to really have a formidable you know defensive grid. Um, 
Now, during this period, we also see that there is increasing religious intolerance and tension as compared to earlier periods. So, um, er, the sort of golden age of Cordoba is long past, and now there is some religious animosity, but it still shouldn't be greatly exaggerated. Um, there are still a lot of trade um, between Granada and its Christian neighbors, and they still have a lot of interactions, and there are some friendships which go across the border. So, um, while things have gotten less tolerant, we shouldn't necessarily think that this is um, like the First Crusade or that kind of mindset by any stretch of the imagination. So, Granada did experience a fair amount of erosion between 1292 and 1462. This is a period where Castilian nobles on the marches were able to take various cities and strongholds but this is over a long period of time, and ultimately, this wasn't a ton of land. Um, however, the main problem for Granada going forward was that as a smaller kingdom, which is now experiencing economic difficulty due to the activities of the Portuguese disrupting their trade routes, is that there's now a gunpowder arms race starting in the 13th century and getting more important as time progresses. Um, because you need quite a bit of money to buy these new and expensive weapons. So, at first, gunpowder weapons aren't that big of a deal. They're not really all that much more effective than traditional catapults. But by the time we get to the 15th century, we have heavy bombards which render medieval fortifications completely obsolete. And for Granada, this will spell doom in the same way that it spelled doom for Constantinople, as it tried to hold out against the Ottomans. Let's take a look at what's going on internally in Castile. In the 13th century, Castile, contrary to its reputation as a destroyer of learning, was actually founding many universities. And it gets this reputation because of the way that it handles um, Granada following the Reconquista. We'll talk about that. It was basically a period of book burning and other openly anti-intellectual activity. But the 13th century was an age when Castile was founding many universities. During this time, Castile was the dominant power in Iberia. And from the 13th century forward, Castilian was not only the official language of government, but it was also the dominant language for international affairs within Iberia. It was the lingua franca of the region. However, Castile was often engaged in conflicts with Aragon, Portugal, Granada, you know, basically its neighbors, and it also suffered from the occasional civil war. So that's why there was this long pause. It's because Castile is doing other stuff, mostly fighting its neighbors and fighting um, for the throne of Castile. So if things really slowed down in 1230, they slow down even more around 1270. By this point, both Ferdinand III of Castile and James I of Aragon were dead, and both of these guys had been the chief proponents of crusading in their respective realms. In 1309, the two monarchs of Castile and Aragon make a pact to conquer Granada, and they go all in for it, but clearly they were unsuccessful. However, Castile was able to take Gibraltar that same year in 1309, but eventually the Granadans were able to recapture it in 1333. So, what happened? I mean, aside from Granada having good rulers and using solid diplomacy and taking advantage of the various internal divisions among uh, the ruling families of these kingdoms. Well, let's take a look and find out. As was the case throughout Europe, Castile and Aragon have a conflict of authority between the crown and the nobles. And whenever the king's authority is challenged and weakened, this really weakens his ability to conquer things. And both of these countries will experience this to varying degrees over the course of this period. Um, there is a thing called a Cortes in both countries that is basically the Spanish equivalent of a parliament. And in true medieval fashion, these so-called parliaments are really just gatherings of nobles and have nothing in common with a modern parliament. We see a similar tension arise in Portugal at a later date, much later, and it has its origins due to the area that was reconquered in the far south of Portugal, which was never fully settled. 
So because that area was never fully settled, it basically became a large ranching area, and the families that controlled these huge estates in the south became disproportionately powerful and were able to then really put a lot of pressure on the Portuguese crown. But again, this happens at a later date. And but when you have, in the general, the nobles fighting the crown for positions of power, this means that you have lots of noble revolts. And if you're a king and you're trying to both put down noble revolts and retain your inherited prerogatives as king, you usually have bigger fish to fry than trying to gain more ground from Granada. Because, you know, your first priority is hanging on to what you already have. So this is part of why... Granada is not pressed as hard as it could have been. Earlier I mentioned that Portugal had gotten itself involved in North Africa. Well, why did this happen? Simple. Portugal wanted to expand further, but they couldn't because they didn't share a common border with Granada, and they couldn't really cross through Castile without provoking a war against a much more powerful enemy. So from 1415 on, they decided to build a navy, and attack North Africa. So the Portuguese would attack Kuta, Tangier, and other major cities along the northwestern African coast. And this expansionist energy that the Portuguese displayed in their wars in Africa was very closely related to the activities of exploration that Portugal is much better known for during this period. We'll get to all those in a different video. But alas, time runs short and it's time to kill off Granada. So in 1469, Ferdinand and Isabella are married, and while this is not the official beginning of the unity between Castile and Aragon, it more or less actually is. Isabella has the stronger kingdom. She is the heiress of Castile, so she is the stronger of the two partners, despite the fact that we normally think of the king as being more prominent than the queen. That is not the case when it comes to Ferdinand and Isabella. And both of them will have separate administrations, but rule jointly and have a common foreign policy. It's another one of those kind of complex crown of arrangements, which is um, not as simple to explain as your average everyday monarchy. So, uh, in 1481, for reasons that I'm not entirely clear on, Granada decided to attack one of the border cities of its neighbor. And this led Castile-Aragon to decide that it was time to complete the Reconquista and launch an all-out war. So from 1481 to 1492, there is a long series of involved sieges. And at the end of this period, Granada itself falls and the kingdom is done for. Here is a painting of the last you know, ruler of Granada surrendering to Ferdinand and Isabella. I don't think this is probably all that accurate, but, you know, it looks cool. And soon thereafter, famously in 1492, the remaining Moors and Jews of Spain were expelled. And there was also some other really obscure event in 1492, but, you know, we'll talk about that later when we talk about exploration. Let's explore the tricky issue of Spanish memory. How does Spain remember this time period? Well, in the Spanish traditional historical narrative, they really try to downplay the influence of the Moors on the development of Spain politically, its culture, and its language, and they try to sort of whitewash the Moors out of history and just talk about the Spanish kingdoms. And sometimes that narrative takes a very conservative Catholic uh, form. And they really just look at the entire period from the 8th century to 1492 as one continuous Reconquista. However, as we've seen, um, El Cid did not receive the memo on fighting a holy war, and he was still regarded as a great hero in his time. He even got an epic poem. So, clearly that is not accurate. So, because of that, more recent scholars have been taking a more nuanced view of East Spain in the uh, Middle Ages, and they're starting to acknowledge and trace the role played by the Moors. In truth, Spain could not have gotten to where it is today without the Moor, Moorish influence. Had the Visigoths continued to rule Spain for the seven centuries, Spain would look a lot different than it looks today, and I'm sure that the Spanish language would also be a fair amount different than what it actually is. What is the legacy of Al-Andalus? 
Well, by medieval standards, Al-Andalus was a great center of learning. It was prosperous, and it achieved a level of religious tolerance, which was fairly unusual for the Middle Ages. It also, in addition to producing many Islamic scholars, produced quite a few Christian scholars as well, since Christian scholars could further their, their education by studying in Cordoba or Granada, which had superior universities as compared to the ones available in the West at the time. There also, um, El Andalus played some role in helping to restore text to the West, which would help to spur on the Renaissance. And the main text that would be restored to Western possession would be Aristotle. Now, while most Greek texts would come from the Byzantines, Aristotle was started to be recovered in Latin translation uh, from the Arabs of Spain through the great scholar Averro, who was most like who was almost certainly the greatest scholar to be to uh, live in Spain during the whole period between 711 and 1492. And this is a statue of Averro. In addition to Averro and other great scholars, this is also a period and a place where the Jews are more or less tolerated by their Muslim overlords, and therefore Jewish philosophy and poetry also prospered during this time. So if you ever studied Jewish culture in the Middle Ages, um, the Jews of Al-Andalus would feature pretty prominently. And comparatively, again, we're talking about medieval standards, so let's not get too carried away. Um, there actually was a relatively high degree of tolerance for homosexuals in Al-Andalus, at least during certain periods. I can't imagine that the Almoravids, you know, look too kindly on that kind of thing. But, you know, there were certain periods where um, there were semi-openly gay people, uh, which you wouldn't think of for the Middle Ages, but uh, there it is. So anyway, all on the loose, um, we shouldn't take, we shouldn't look at its legacy through uh, really rose-tinted glasses, but at the same time, it did achieve quite a bit for its time, and it is a very interesting frontier society where we see people of different faiths interacting and living together successfully and really creating an interesting um, society and a place that was pretty nice to live by the standards of its own day. So I'll just quit rambling now, and uh, you can take it from here in your own heads or in the comment section or whatever.